Hello, my lovelies, Dr. Minette Riordan here, painting in your PJs live with Minette. Today, I am not in my PJs and I'm not live, but I had some thoughts on my mind that I wanted to just stop by and share about art scars. What are art scars or creativity scars and how do we move through them? Where do they come from? And I really love the work of Brene Brown and she's done a lot of research around shame and vulnerability, as you probably know. But one of the, thing, the things that was like an unexpected finding was how many people when asked about some of those deep childhood wounds referred to creativity scars or art scars being uh, the origin of a lot of their shame. And the thing that stopped them maybe from doing something that they really loved. <clears throat> So what I wanted to just kind of noodle around, I don't have a, a plan for this talk, not that I ever have a plan for my talks, but I wanted to talk about this just deep wound that so many of us carry around art making. We're often told that our art isn't good enough, that art isn't valuable, that it's self-indulgent, it's a waste of time. We live in a culture that prioritizes making money and productivity and putting others first. And yet in the most intimate parts of ourselves, creativity is innate. It's natural. It's something that every human being on the planet possesses, whether you make art and paint and draw or dance or photography or design or gardening, there are so many expressions of creativity. And it's one of the things that as human beings on this planet really sets us apart from every other species is our capacity for creative thinking, for problem solving, for interesting combinations of things that other people haven't put together. And until we can really acknowledge and name those art scars, then they're going to continue to haunt us. We're going to continue to set our art aside and say it's not valuable, it's not important, it's not meaningful, it's not relevant, it's not a useful waste of my time. And I was one of those people that had some pretty deep art scars. I've shared this story before. In particular, I made a lot of art as a kid growing up, very creative family was making and selling stained glass when I was in high school, loved my drawing class. And just a couple of years ago, I found my old sketch pad from my high school drawing class. And it wasn't half bad, but if you would have asked me a few years ago if I could draw, I would have told you, no, I can't draw. And it took me a while to unravel the origin of that story. And now I freely admit I'm a total overachiever that I have always been an A student. It was really important to me to get good grades in my freshman year in university. I took a drawing class just for fun. It wasn't my major. My major was literature, Spanish literature, and didn't get a good grade in this class and didn't get good reviews or responses to my art. And so I quit. I gave up. I'm like, this is a waste of my time. This isn't my major. I was just here for fun to explore this avenue. And I pretty much quit making art for about 20 years. And then I discovered soul collage. And then I discovered Zentangle. And then I started painting and drawing. And I started writing poetry. And that creativity came to life in me again. And I've loved every minute of my creative journey since then, but it hasn't been an easy journey because some of those art scars keep coming back to haunt me. That one, and there've been a few others along the way, but the worst impact of those art scars, a, a watercolor class I took when I was in grad school that was supposed to be for beginners and it was so hard. I was so lost. I never went back. It was like a six or eight week class. I paid. I went once and I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I'm out. And both of those occurrences were about making art fun, about finding an outlet for self-expression that was personal and meaningful for me, not about making art for a career. I knew pretty clearly from early on that I wanted to be a teacher. 
and I became a teacher briefly, and then I became an entrepreneur, and I've owned my own businesses, multiple businesses for the last 20 plus years. And it was like a part of my soul had been cut off. I couldn't have identified it that way at the time. I didn't know I was pushing that part of me aside. All I knew was I'm being judged and criticized over here for this thing that I'm doing. So why waste my time? I have all these other things that I can do. So what happened was I started to channel my creative energy in a variety of different directions and ways. My businesses became my big creative outlet or at the holidays, I would make handmade gifts. I loved Martha Stewart kits. I would make fun ornament kits or my Aunt Vina's beautiful little felted ornaments. I did needlepoint and stitching, but nothing that felt really hard, right? They were all things that felt pretty easy and simple. And the reason that I'm talking about this today is because I went to a meeting the other night with a whole bunch of amazing artists. And when they asked me what I did and what I what my medium was, rather than confidently saying, I'm a mixed media artist and intuitive painter, I said, oh, art is just my hobby. It's not my thing. Here's what I really do over here. And I found myself being in such a deep place of just judgment and criticism about my own art. I was nobody had seen my art. Nobody knew if I was an amazing artist or a crafter or what, right? And there was no judgment from anyone in this room. It, this was not an experience about them. It was an experience completely about me being triggered by those old art scars. And I've been painting for years. I, my paintings are around the walls behind me. I love my painting. I'm very confident in my creative abilities these days, but in that moment, standing in a gallery full of art, surrounded by a whole lot of people who art is their living, it's not mine, it's just my, uh, the thing that is most meaningful and important to me, and I love sharing it with others, in that moment I didn't share it, because I was afraid of making a stand and claiming I am artist. And it took me by surprise, and I had to really do some deep emotional work, reach out and ask for support and get to the, the core of what's going on here. And through that was able to really get in touch with some of those early art scars that every time I get asked to talk about my art, I was just wanting to go in like this and hide and say, I'm an artist, as opposed to, hi, I'm Manette and I am an artist. Completely different energies. And it was a big learning experience for me that I'm still intimidated sometimes when I'm with other artists to share my work, to share that part of me. And I'm not someone who lacks confidence or lacks a clear voice in most of my life, but clearly this was one of those triggers that was still in the way. And so I feel like by just uncovering and identifying a specific trigger the emotional story that started to build up all that scar tissue over the years. Now I can move through it. Now I can confidently say when I'm in this room full of artists, I am an artist. Here's my art. I can submit my art to some of the collective shows of this gallery. It's never been specifically a goal of mine to be have my work shown in a gallery, but how cool would it be? So I'm looking at my own identity as an artist very differently and looking at where are those art scars still lingering, where are they still impacting or stopping me from really committing to my work as an artist and my painting. And I'm curious if maybe you're feeling that way too, that you get caught up in it's not important, it's indulgent, it's selfish all things that I've heard from clients over the years in my work as both a business owner, uh, as a business coach, sorry, and as now as really a creative guide and facilitator for creative process. And if I had a dime for every time one of my clients said to me, my parents wouldn't pay for me to go to art school. 
I'd be a much wealthier woman than I am today. And it was heartbreaking. And at their core, the parents had their kids' best interest at heart. They were trying to protect them the best they knew and channel them. But ultimately, what they did was to just cut off the core spirit of so many people who should have been artists, who now have quiet in those voices that are their true zone of genius. And it's why I'm so passionate about sharing my thoughts and my art and my work with others. I love working privately one-on-one -on -one with people around these deep art scars and creating a lot of programs and opportunities to just be in this discussion. Because what I find is that the more that we dig in and we say, this is important today, I prioritize my art. Tomorrow, I prioritize my art. I shared another video a week or so ago about the one question that changed my life, which was, what would happen if I put art in the center of my life? Well, magic happened when I started to prioritize and make time for my art. And I'm here today to just say to you, I see you, artist. I see you. I see beyond the art scars. And I'm saying this to you, and I'm saying it here in the camera to myself, I am enough. I'm worthy. I deserve to commit and make time for art. doesn't have to take over my life. But if I make time every day for creative expression, I feel more grounded. I feel more relaxed and calm. I feel a deep well of satisfaction from, look at what I made, even if it's only my husband that sees it. Right? So I invite you today to just get curious and to think back and to ask yourself, what might be possible for me if I let go of some of those old stories I've been telling myself and made more time for my art, made a little space in my house for art? What would happen if I was brave enough to share my art with one other person? And make sure you share it with someone who loves you and will say it's great no matter what. That's one of the ways to overcome your creativity scars. So how do we start to grow in courage and confidence to release these creativity scars? There's a few different ways. One is to make more art, to just be in the practice of making art and to build your confidence. Two, take a class and learn a skill. Three is you got to be willing to be in beginner's mind. You have to be willing to approach art making like a kindergartner who's learning to write their letters or to draw a tree for the first time. Kids innately know how to draw symbols that represent the things that matter to them. They know what a house looks like. They know what a tree looks like. They can draw stick figures. They don't actually need a lot of teaching around that. And so I think that we have to reconnect to the joy of childlike creative expression. And finally, I would say, what was I going to say? I just totally lost my train of thought. I love when I'm doing that when I'm in the middle of the talking, right? So we make more art. We have beginner's mind. We figure out what the origin of that story is. And we practice, 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 practice. Every day, every few days, whatever you can manage. But we start to look at making art as a radical act of self-love, as a courageous act of saying, this is mine to do. Because the more that we do that, the more it opens and expands our creative thinking, the more that it influences and impacts every single area of our lives. And so I want to encourage you this week, if you still got some of those, you know, tricky little art scars lingering around, give them a little attention, love on that part of you a little bit on that sweet child that was impacted by something someone said or something that was said around you. I love Chase Jarvis loved art as a kid and he was a very talented soccer player and he overheard an art teacher. This is uh, a story from his book, Creative Calling. And he talks about how he overheard the teacher saying, the art teacher saying to his mom, oh, he's better at soccer. You should channel all his energy over there. And so he did. He became a professional soccer player. Didn't like it. I think he became a doctor. Didn't like it. 
and or started going to medical school. And then he went backpacking around Europe with his camera and fell in love with photography. And from photography, he built an online business to a whole school called Creative Live, which is really wonderful program. But that one person, that conversation that was overheard about, he's not that great an artist, he should go do this, killed that innate creative instinct in him to love art making for art making sake. And then I remembered what the other thing I was going to say, and I'll end with this, is to let go of expectations. This is connected to beginner's mind, is to let go of the end product and to enjoy the creative process. It's what I try to show here uh, ongoingly on Painting in Your PJs with Manette is this idea of <clears throat> this is play, this is process, this is experience. It's great when pages turn out pretty, but they don't always, right? It's great when canvases feel like they're pretty enough to hang on the walls, but that doesn't always happen. I started one the other day and I painted over the whole thing. So letting go of our attachment to what art should be will also help untangle some of those art scars to stop comparing ourselves to what others are creating and create the things that bring us the most joy. So if you're struggling with art scars, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. And if you need some support untangling those, reach out and let me know, because I think that the world needs my art, and I know that the world needs your art too. Have a beautiful rest of your day, my friends, and I'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.